Today on Adorama Live on No Film School, we go through Blackmagic's new releases of the Ursa and Pocket cameras from top to bottom with Jason Druss, Blackmagic product specialist. But first, we have exciting new news from Light Panel about one of their products. This is Adorama Live on No Film School. Welcome to Adorama Live on No Film School. I am your host, Steve Pierce. On this show, we talk to filmmakers and video professionals about techniques and technology. And we're not only bringing you the newest engineering and releases here from the NAB Show 2019, we're bringing in creative leads like directors of photography and also creative directors to show you how to use that technology more effectively. You can see all of our shows of Adorama Live on nofilmschool.com. So please, go check them all out. Light panels is an industry standard. When I think about a light panel Gemini, I think about a very high output but low uh, power pull, very high CRI, which is the most important to me, and full RGB tr uh, controlled light. But Light Panels has just released their new one by one Gemini, which is all the same features of the larger Gemini. We're actually using one of them here on the set as a backlight for Adorama Live on this table here for our first setup. Let's take a look at some of the features from the new one by one Gemini. Joining me today on Adorama Live is Pat Grosvent, the co the co-founder of Light Panels. I am a co-founder. You're a co-founder as well. Oh, <laughs> <Go crows. laughs> Pat, it's wonderful to have you here, Thanks. man. Thanks for having me. So tell me, we are looking at the one by one Gemini. Yes. Right? And we just saw the videos from it. Let's uh what tell me tell me about what's at the core of Light Panels one by one Gemini? Really creative technology. Um, a lot of people know our products even within voice distance of how light panels has been developing innovative products, but also making sure that we have color accuracy, uh, color correctness, full spectrum lighting, and then with the Gemini 2x1, which was launched last year, uh, we created the use of RGB technology. So in the Gemini 1x1 soft, you get a lot of the same features you get in the 2x1 with a couple other features thrown in for good habit. Great, like, so for instance, this is still RGB, but it's still a soft light that's fully dialable to C by CTT to, you know, uh, daylight and tungsten. Yeah, we believe that most image capture is best done with something in the daylight spectrum to the tungsten. So you have the ability to dim between the two and have actually correct spectrum. Uh, after that, we have RGB, and the RGB helps when you're in your daylight or tungsten settings because you can add plus or minus green. Um, but we rely on those daylight chips and those tungsten chips to give you color accuracy. The RGB kicks in later when you want to do party effects or sirens and or washes and, all those, and you know yeah, all the different and things that people are looking for in a smaller package. And I think that's what's unique about this one by one is the fact that it's small, it's durable, it's aluminium based. Um, we have a removable cover that you can change the density of the white filter uh, and actually make it a little bit more light output from it or a little bit less. But the real unique thing is about its well balanced, the fact that you can lay it down or even if you were going to put it down on tabletop or underneath something, 
we're making sure that we leave enough adequate space for air because air is an important part with LED technology. You want to introduce the opportunity to cool those LEDs when needed. Right, and also like your connections. Like if you look here on the side, we've got the DMX on the top, and this is you told me this is why we have wireless uh, controls built into this light Correct. as well, right? And then also the power, the XLR power, which we're running this with two um, Anton Bauer Gold Brick batteries just right here. And let's uh, actually just go ahead and flip this bad boy on here so we can see. What we've got. I think you did a great job describing the product, don't you? We should give Roy a, a, <laughs> Thank you. A little That's bit the applause. first time I've gotten applause on this show. Thank you very much. It's better. important to remember, everybody's working together. <laughs> yeah, and so it does lay down in all directions. I also like here with the, uh, the, the, the connection to a stand, you can either do a 5 8 baby pin or it'll go into a 2K receiver Right, as so well. for some of your viewers that aren't sure of that, the idea is on this TVMP that you can actually unscrew the T-handle that you would use to secure it on a 5 8 inch pin, like a baby stand or C-stand head, and by taking that out and making the show longer than it has to be with the time it takes, but actually this now will fit into a junior receiver. So it's a great feature that a lot of different developers have used, but we've incorporated it also with a stainless steel TVMP and this steel T-handle that won't strip or become a problem with being cross-threaded. It's a little things. And just so this is fully dimmable from 100 to down to 0.1% with no flicker at all. Correct. And that's completely confirmed. We're 100% confident. It that. is. It's actually, I was in uh, BRTV in China and the Sony engineers from Japan came over and asked if we could maybe make a widget up the hook up to the camera so they didn't have flicker. And we put it at... Uh, 0.1% and they shot it with three of their top cameras and no flicker no matter what shutter angle or frame rate they did it. So to them it was the best LED we, we'd, uh, they'd ever seen. But we think the, the idea is to understanding the market of illumination because my partners and I all came from that business. And so all through the course of Light Panel's histories it's kind of been able to understand what the market's looking for how to use it, how to use the newest technology to incorporate into their bits and bobs, if you will, and that'll make a job easier. It's, it's a pretty fluid environment these days for a lot of filmmakers. So having the portability factor with something this small, uh, the power supply, Craig, can you end that? The power supply, I always like to show the light without the power supply, because you see the, the form factor and how cool it is. But the power supply can attach to the yoke. Uh, there's capture screws. Uh, we're drawing 200 watts, so the power supplies are 200 water. Or can I see that other battery plate? This is one of our uh, battery plates. This is showing the Anton Bauer V-mount model. Uh, you can use this attached to the yoke at the same time. And you can actually power through the power supply in through the battery, the battery feeder into the unit. So if you were run and gun and you wanted to pull the Come power out of AC and go, power, you already have a brick on. It's instantaneous. There's no delay in it capturing the power from the battery. And then the unit you had earlier, which is for our, our two by one, um, because we're using 200 watts, we needed to have two units on it. But the beauty of that bracket for the Gemini or even in here is you can get a lot of burn time at 200 watts with two 150s on a Gemini or with the two by one Gemini, so. Speaking of your run and gun form factor, so this is, uh, the weight is quite, it's, I'm gonna guess, let me, let me get it. Hold on, one more call. Uh, that's, um, I'm just gonna I hope it's a big this. order. They're ordering 100 light panel one by one Geminis. No, it's Nancy Pelosi. She's always calling because I support her. Go oh, ahead. Great, got it. Um, so I'm just gonna guess here, this is a six, seven pounds, right? It is approximately that. And See. with the power supply on it, you're just under 12 pounds. Great, okay, that's awesome. So now I wanna talk about the most important part for this for me, CRI. What's the CRI of this and the- Our CRI has always been a high standing. Daylight in the 97, 98, 96 range, depending on what uh, meter you're using, uh, tungsten 98, 99, uh, 97. The idea of CRI I think is important because we were talking about before we were on the air and you did that crazy dance out here to get people to set, which is like there's 100 people still trying to get in and they can't. The value <laughs> is is that uh, CRI has another accompaniment to it. So CRI Color Rendering Index came out a long time ago. It was for interior designers that were actually looking to uh, find a way to give them an idea if they were going to be doing a um, design of a structural building and there's glass windows. Oh, we need a CRI with something close to the sun. 
the sun's 100, so we need something in the 98, 90, so there's a match. But over time, other people have developed other processes of measuring light accuracy, especially with this digital revolution and semiconductors being the source of light output versus a bulb or a gas. And so you have TLCI, which was developed by Alan Roberts in the UK, where more arrays of colors are used for reflective balance back other than what was originally with CRI. I think it was eight and then it went to 18 with TLCR 24. And now you have the Motion Picture Academy is developing the SSI. So when people are taking readings from light, be aware of the TLCI and be aware of the CRI and be of the SSI. But the idea is we've stayed true to always developing perfect color spectrum daylight based and tungsten based because we're not mixing RGB to make the white light. We're using a white light chip. I'm glad that you said that. So we have the dimming here and this, all the controls within here for controlling the light and all this on the yes. back side. So I want to show, I, I just wanted to show that quickly. And also we have your DMX controls across the top. You Correct. said it included a USB port here for uh, various dongles. Uploads. Yep. And um, also ethernet connection I see here as well. But I want to go back to the chips because I feel like that's the most important part of what we're talking about here. What makes the light the actual quality that we're going to see you, you have five different chips in right, here. Right, let's show everybody because there's no secret to what we're doing, it's the best. The idea is we're using uh, a daylight and a tungsten chip. And then we're introducing red, green, and blue to enable you to hold a daylight or a tungsten spectrum or somewhere in there and then use those colors to manage whether you're matching a diner that has cool white fluorescence in it and you need to add a little bit of green because the set has got a green odor to it. And the idea is that then you can in post pull all the green out, including from your key light, and now everything's in a neutral tone. And the same with adding green or what we call magenta, anti-green or plus green, minus green. And the feature of that is not uh, unknown to a lot of people out there and other manufacturers. I think it's becoming a standard that a lot of people are looking for and manufacturers doing it. But you're not combining RGB to make your white light. No. You're using independent chips no, to make your white light. Correct. That's why and the CRI is so We're traveling high. down the same path we started with. That's the very first LED manufacturer for image capture. And so that idea has worked and people know us by that and they come to see what we offer. And look, it's up to the people that come by the booth or read the articles or go to a store with one of their favorites or what have it, uh, to see it, to touch it, to have that tactile experience. They almost don't need a meter. They can take a look and say, it's in the realm of output that I like. And knowing you have that consistency product after product, if you decide to order more or build up your array, that's the value that comes to any product that somebody's going to put their money down and buy. And you mentioned before, what's the power pull on this? 200 watts at maximum output. So the idea is a lot of people don't want to use a light at 100%. They may use it at 25. So your power consumption is going to drop down. So if you're looking to refine a studio and bring in LED technology, to do a power drop, which in a lot of states you can get a rebate for, uh, that gives you the ability of actually, if they're set at 50%, you're only using 50% of the power. If you were to use a standard dimming system with a 100 watt tungsten incandescent light, an old fixture, if you will, even if it's in the dimmer and you're only using 5%, it's still pulling. It's still pulling. It. So yeah. we're looking for ways to save money so they can get rebates to buy more equipment or what they need for the set. And to speak more on to the run and gun, and, well, not even to the run and gun, but the availability of this, the price point of this is. 2650. You told me that before the show and it just floored me. I can't believe that. I'm glad you feel that way. The complete, uh, uh, the, the other lights that I'm looking that have the same quality, the same consistency, the same kind of controls, or plus the $1,000 at least, more. Um, yeah, and there's, to be fair with everybody, because again, uh, when people come to our booth, uh, just as they do come to your store, you know, you have an array of products because each one of them talks to a specific need of that buyer. And I think that the product should stand on it. And we don't have to worry about who's better than this and that and, and talking about right. But you bring up a really valuable point, which is you can buy something very uh, cheap, cheaper than this, and you can buy something more expensive than this. What we're doing is delivering an option that in my mind brain of 40 years of doing lighting and helping create some of the products with the rest of the team at Light Panels is that I like the organic look of it. I like this, the, the structural build with all aluminum or aluminum. Uh, um, the, the fact that it's rugged, that it'll take a mean, the fact that I can adjust these yokes up and down. All the different attributes that we've developed in may even increase the likelihood that the light could be sides of price. So, 
I love the fact that NAB has so many people exhibiting their products, as you know, and you get a lot of them up here because you pull a good interview. Look at me, I can't even stop. <laughs> well, love Beers them. for everybody. Hey, all right, well, all right, that's the show, everybody. Uh, Pat's buying, so we're going to get out of here. But no. the idea is very true. No. If it makes to, if it speaks to you, you'll buy it. I, it's lightweight, it's low power consumption with a great high output. I mean, I think the easiest thing to say is light panels seem to have done it again. That's um, L-I-T-E-P-A-N-E-L-S dot com. Thank you very much, Pat, for joining me here today. Thanks. <laughs> Thank Good you. Good show, man. Thanks. I was an early adopter and an advocate for Blackmagic hardware. Back in that time, I was designing a lot of studios and doing a lot of live workflows and engineering and doing simple things like converting frame rates or working with multiple camera bodies was just a nightmare. If you could find the right device to do it, it was extremely expensive or it was proprietary. So you had to use all the other equipment from the same manufacturer to do something simple. Enter Blackmagic. Blackmagic changed the game. Um, even like things like they like this show here is all powered by Blackmagic infrastructure with their switchers and their cross converters like the Terranex and the Dex. Blackmagic was so effective at doing simple things that were just intuitive and it worked and they did it at such a price point that it became available for people that had never had the option to do live, pro, live production before. Now they could all do it on their own and so we've seen a big insurgence of live production. We even take these studios with their devices into places like a brewery recently for a late night pilot we shot, popped it up in two days and did an entire half hour late night pilot on location. This is Late Night Cat. So we got seven cables running out of the back of the switcher here. Six, actually, for cameras. Running across the top of the cold box, and we're going to drop it down over there. We have our Teradek wireless returns. Every camera has to run, and it's often down into the basement and under the audience, and then back up through a mouse hole. And the most important thing about running it is labeling both ends. So I'm looping out of the monitors over okay, here. Just right, so they're gonna get the DMCC at lighting so they can see all the cameras. So this is our mobile kit that I use to direct on the road, um, but it also is awesome for live events. Basically all five cameras come into this multi-viewer, which is gonna be for the LD. It's got a power conditioner and three smart Blackmagic smart duos and the reason they're so effective is they accept pretty much any frame rate resolution. The switcher is very 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 temperamental about it. It has to be the right resolution at the right frame rate with the right interlacing. So I can see the camera here and go through the menus and tweak or without me having to be there and we can go through all cameras and debug them all at once. You just take a SDI signal in, then it loops out into the switcher. Uh, the latency on that is super, super, super low, so it's not going to be a problem for me. We're going to basically be looking at the exact same image at the exact same time. All right, getting set up up here, dudes. This is most of our infrastructure, believe it or not, for the whole show. This is the ATEM. Blackmagic 1ME production switcher. In here is a deck in which we're gonna record the, uh, the clean feed of the show. This is a router um, that is going to power our network, like between all the devices, because everything is networked together via ethernet and talks to each other in the back end. And then this is a Terranex 2D that does conversions. In this case, what we're gonna be doing is running the iMac into the Terranex so it can feed video to us while simultaneously the iMac's also going to be networked into the back end of the switcher and be loading graphics as we go to the show. We'll put this larger monitor on top to be the line cut so we can all see it. And I've still got to do a little practice and research with the Grass Valley interface about how to do the DVE uh, inputs for the images. Um, I'm going to build it in the software and then go for the interface to cut it. Computer software is talking to the back end of the switcher. Check this and see if we can get this all connected and talking. We basically have two different main lines here, right? Obviously there's audio and then there's video. And they basically stay in their own independent worlds. The only thing that really crosses over is the iMac. So now I'm routing the Terranex 
which is going to be the feed for the computer visually for video playback into the switcher into input 7. So the Teranex is going to allow us to take that video, bring it into the switcher visually, and also break out the audio to XLR so I can send it to the mix for playback in the house. <laughs> Did you ask Matt to carry a keg? But, but not me. Because I'm a woman, you think I can't lift a keg? Because I'm, I'm sorry, are you laughing? Well, I weigh 160 pounds, a little heavier than a box of wine. Obviously, it's a pre recorded element that we're playing in, so it doesn't really matter the record of the audio, it matters the audience's laughs recorded live. We have six different lavalier mics three audience plant mics that are in the truss to get the audience laughs. It's because we don't, I do not want to use a laugh track. I want it to be legitimate. I got the video lines run, but made a crucial mistake with my pre-planning. It didn't think ahead to run the XLR at the same time. So now I get to bring the lift back and run a second round of cable. So that's a good lesson. Um, should have taken an extra second and really made sure I looked over my schematics. I totally just missed the audio path. Thank God for editing, right? From there, fast forward a few years, and Blackmagic enters the cinema camera game. And I think everyone was very excited to see what Blackmagic was going to do with those cameras and how they were going to revolutionize the industry again. And since then, every year has held a new camera release, an update to an old one, and a new way of thinking about what cameras and cinema or what people that use cinema cameras want and based on user feedback. So today, to look at the new Blackmagic cinema cameras and their product line is product specialist Jason Druss, my guest today from Blackmagic. Jason, thank you very much for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me, really appreciate it, yeah. So we, today, you've brought with you the uh, Pocket Camera Cinema 4K, right? Pocket, Pocket Cinema, cinema camera, camera 4K, 4K. Yeah. yeah. Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. And we yes. also, you've just released the Ursa Mini Pro G2, correct? That's right. Well, why don't we just not bury the lead? Um, let's let's go through the specs right away. What I mean, what resolutions, frame rates, mount, all that. What can you give me? Yeah, absolutely. Let's go through it. So for the Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, we're dealing with a micro four-thirds lens mount, but we're actually dealing with a full four-thirds inch chip. Now, this four-third inch sensor has 13 stops of dynamic range, and it's capable of recording up to DCI 4K. So we've got the full 4096 by 2160p. Um, what else about the camera? It's got this really beautiful five-inch touchscreen. You mind if I actually grab a hold of that yeah, and play with it, it a little bit? I've not had my hands on yeah, it yet. Yeah, play around with it. Yeah, so again, just built in, just like every most everything Blackmagic started doing recently, it has monitors built into it, which again, just like the hardware, it is, I can't say how <laughs> clever that is and how stupid I feel that it didn't exist before. Well, it's not just that it has the five-inch touchscreen monitor, it's that the operating system inside of the camera is actually the same Blackmagic operating system as the Ursa Mini Pro line. So you've got the full monitoring options. Um, when you're on set, a camera operator might want to see different data than a DIT or a client in the back viewing your, uh, your content in Video Village. So you can decide who sees what. You can turn on your focus peaking. You can turn on the blue gun. You can turn on specific frame guides, everything from 4 by 3 all the way to the new 2 to 1 aspect ratio that a lot of cinematographers really like shooting with lately. Um, and again, you can access that through the touch screen. And we also have this really nifty kind of little shuttle dial in the front of the camera when you put your right hand around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. around the grip there, you can um, automatically use that to adjust your uh, white balance, your ISO, your color temperature, um, your And your I think speed. those are selectable from here. Does that activate that button? If I they press do. That, yes, it does. That's yeah. exactly what it does. So I press this simple button here and activate it on the front. That's right. And then by default, I think it's always going to go to the iris. Correct. Um, and then we've got the three Seems function buttons on the top. Um, we've got the four stereo microphones in front of the camera. Um, it's one of the best scratch track, or I should say on-camera microphones um, you've ever heard. And one of the coolest things that's important is the air intake and outtake. There's two air intakes on the top and one on the bottom. Um, and they're right near the sensor because we pay a lot of attention to the temperature of the sensor. Because the temperature of the sensor dictates how much noise you're going to enter in the shadows and the image unnecessarily. So we pay a lot of attention to making sure the temperature of the sensor stays at a a normal temp so you're not you know adding noise into the shot after the end of a 12 hour day because you've been shooting with the camera all day right absolutely so how does this compare the pocket camera is very very popular i know many people that bought the first one bought the second one how does this compare to the most recent release of the pocket uh, pocket cinema camera you mean how does the uh, 4k pocket cinema camera compare to the original one correct yeah well it's it's a really big world of an update because when we wanted when we released the original pocket cinema camera we had no idea how people were going to react to it or what people were going to use it for and it turned out every 
everyone used it for everything. It was used on Hollywood movies like um, like uh, one of the Avengers movies. It's used on TV shows like Chicago Fire. And um, essentially what we wanted to do was we wanted to make a smaller camera that was very powerful. But our users were telling us that they really wanted a lot of uh, more professional features on the camera. So while it's a philosophical update to the original pocket camera, it's larger than the original pocket camera was. But we did that because we wanted to take all of the best features and tools from the Ursa Mini Pro line, from our higher end cameras, and find a way to compact them into a much smaller, much lightweight, handheld, agile, um, compact camera. And this was the end result of those two worlds kind of mixing together. What kind of lens mount does this come with? Uh, it's a, a micro four thirds by default, but you know, as we both know, micro four thirds is one of the most adaptable lens right. mounts out there. So if you got a, a speed booster or any kinds of lens adapter, you, you can, can um, augment it to, to fit PL lenses, Canon EF, or really anything you want. And what kind of media does it take? It looks like it shoots on a... Yeah, it actually shoots on an SD card or a CFast 2.0 card, because again, we, we really want to... Um, make technology accessible and we want to lower the cost of ownership as much as possible. So if you're an Ursa Mini Pro user and you've already got your CFast 2.0 cards or your SD cards, well you should be able to use those cards on this camera too. So you have the option. But additionally, one of the cool things is the USB-C port on the side of the camera. Mm -hmm. you, can, um, you can actually plug in a flash SSD drive oh, and really? record straight to that oh, drive nice. and bypass the uh, media I believe on that's, the camera. Yeah, just right in here. Yeah, I see like the yeah. new USB port right And we here. have the brand new Pocket Cinema Camera 4K battery grip, oh, which that, is mm -hmm. going to come out later this year. The battery door of that camera actually comes off if you wanted to, mm -hmm. and the new battery grip is going to fit le like a magazine right, right in, into the bottom and attached to and the... And screw into the bottom of the camera, yeah. And um, it's going to fit two of the larger Sony batteries, so you'll be able to record for hours. Uh, without having to change batteries. And we did this because we noticed, especially, you know, with one of the things about having a smaller camera is having a smaller battery. Mm -hmm. So while the Canon LPE6 batteries are, are much, have much higher capacity than um, the Nikons in the original Pocket Cinema camera, um, power draw is still a, a concern, especially for people that are going to be plugging in SSD drives and other accessories powered through the camera. So the battery grip kind of uh, helps solve that problem. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the Ursa Mini Pro G2. Yeah. So that's a new release as well. So can we just run, give me a brief like overview of what's changed in this. And in the background, I believe we have the, uh, some clips that were shot by the Ursa Mini Pro G1. That's right, by uh, Roy Wagner ASC um, with a feature film called Stand, which was shot in, uh, in Canada um, earlier last year. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. So what is new about the G2? Yeah, so between the Ursa Mini Pro G1 and G2, essentially, we have a, uh, a new sensor which utilizes our 4.0 color science, which is the best color science we've ever had. The color uniformity and the color clarity is much better on this new sensor and this new camera than what we've ever had in the past. Additionally, we were able to configure the sensor differently, and the readout time of the sensor is half of the time of the original Ursa Mini Pro. So the Ursa Mini G2, I believe, has about um, like a four and a half millisecond readout, um, which is twice as fast as, as uh, the previous model. What that means is we're going to have less rolling shutter, we're going to have better co color fidelity, we're going to have uh, better performance in all conditions, even at slower frame rates. Additionally, the Ursa Mini Pro G2, because of this new sensor readout, we were able to manipulate the technology to record even higher frame rates. Um, when you're shooting 4.6K, if you're shooting Blackmagic RAW 8 to 1, you're going to be able to record up to 120 frames per second with the full 4.6K sensor. Wow. If, yeah, it's, it's huge. If you're doing regular DCI 4K, you jump that up to 150 mm. frames per second. Um, and if you're shooting in a windowed HD mode, you can go all the way up to 300 frames per second. Wow. Um, and the one thing you'll notice about our slow motion, and, and there are already examples on, uh, on the web to show this, and users can look it up, but um, usually when you're shooting slow motion on a camera, you're usually sacrificing some kind of sharpness or quality. But if you look at the slow motion that's coming out of our cameras, it's just as sharp as the stuff that's reading out it at 24p. That's amazing. Well, you mentioned, uh, you, you mentioned Blackmagic RAW, which I think is a great transition to what is Blackmagic RAW's functionality and how do these cameras work together as an environment? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm really excited about Blackmagic RAW. We brought Blackmagic RAW to the Pocket Cinema Camera 4K uh, a couple months ago. Um, and it's native on the Ursa Mini Pro G1 and G2. But essentially, we realized that when you want to shoot RAW, which our cameras have always been able to do because we believe in shooting the highest quality possible, um, usually the question of do we shoot RAW becomes a question of can we afford it in the budget? How much time do we have to edit this project? 
do we right. have the storage capacity for this project? And, and do we want to deal with an online or offline workflow? And if not, do we have a computer that's expensive enough or big enough to be able to handle a native raw cinema DNG workflow? Right. Um, and that's usually the conversation with all kinds of raw media. So we wanted to change that. So with Blackmagic Raw, you end up having the file sizes and the workflow requirements of like a traditional 10-bit video, right? So, I mean, myself, personally, I have a 15-inch MacBook Pro. It was the first one with the touch bar. It was made in 2016. Um, you know, pretty standard basic laptop. And I can shoot uh, on the Pocket Cinema Camera 4K or the Ursa Mini Pro uh, G1, which I have experience with because the G2 is so brand new. Right. Um, I can shoot 4.6K or 4K Blackmagic RAW, 5 to 1, 8 to 1, 12 to 1, even 3 to 1. It's all just going to simply play back in real time, even on wow. a laptop. I can cut with it. I can color with it. I can export it with reasonable time frames. Um, I don't need to cache a lot of stuff um, because we have this demosaicing process that happens inside the camera. So we're actually churning um, everything that it takes to play it back in real time and compressing the file size while you're actually recording. So it's like an engine's running while you're shooting your footage. Um, and what that gives us is a traditional 10-bit video type workflow with the flexibility of 12-bit RAW. So when you say 10-bit workflow, I'm assuming you mean something like ProRes 422. You know, or even DNX, or you know, any... Uh, any yeah, uh, DNX HD 225 or whatever it is. Any popular 10-bit yeah. format you're working right. with. And when it comes to the file sizes, um, when you're shooting uh, Blackmagic RAW, um, you know, I think um, uh, 8 to 1 or even 12 to 1, with 12 to 1, which is still an incredibly high quality, that's what I personally show when I'm demoing Blackmagic RAW, hmm. you're dealing with data rates somewhere between, um, you know, ProRes LT and ProRes 422, which is really astronomical. Depending on what you're shooting, that could definitely be enough. Like for most, in many, many cases, I find ProRes LT to be more than enough when in my work. Well, the, the quality of the Blackmagic RAW is, is so phenomenal that you, um, you can shoot eight to one if you want to. I mean, sure, you can shoot five to one, but me personally, I always shoot 12 to one because when I first saw the demo, it's funny, I didn't even know there was a tab in the metadata to view the compression of the type of Blackmagic RAW you were shooting. I just assumed I was working with three to one because the quality was so sharp and I had so much detail in the shadows. And then I was actually at a demo, um, actually showing the Blackmagic RAW because someone asked what kind it was. I was like, oh, well, let's see if we can find out the codec. And it was all 12 to one. Well, there you go. Yeah. And uh, it's just a, a really phenomenal codec, but the best part about it also is some of the metadata that comes with it. Because when you're in DaVinci Resolve, um, you can go ahead and you can pick the gamma curve and the, the color space you want to, and uh, you can um, update all of your camera raw metadata natively, and then you can update the sidecar file that comes with each clip. And with Blackmagic RAW 1.3, which was just released, if you have a LUT loaded in the Pocket Cinema Camera or the Ursa Mini Pros, which you can load your own lookup tables in there if you make it or you get it online, wh whatever you like, um, that lookup table is going to stay with the file throughout its course throughout post production in the Blackmagic RAW file. You can choose to turn it off, it's totally non destructive, but instead of having to reload that lookup table back in DaVinci Resolve or any program that uses Blackmagic RAW, um, instead of having to load it back in yourself, it's just going to stay with the file and you can non destructively turn it on and off. That's a huge update to Blackmagic RAW 1.3, which was just releasing an update a couple weeks ago. So if you're creating your custom looks on set, I'm shooting this scene, I want it to look this way, I have this thing, it accompanies that file into post, so even that you can look at that on site and see what uh, see exactly what you'd intended. Yeah, absolutely. And because of these technologies, you know, people are actually able to um, afford a scenario where they can color grade on set with a micro panel or a mini panel, create a lookup table, use Resolve Live with something really affordable like an Ultra Studio HD Mini. They can export a LUT, they can put it into the camera, they can view it, they can uh, manipulate who's seeing what information so the, the client in the video village doesn't have to look at a right. logarithmic image. You can give them yeah, a, just a, a, a flat output with, a, with just the LUT on it and no metadata. Um, and then you can bring that all into DaVinci Resolve and it's waiting for you and you don't need a crazy, fast, huge machine to deal with it and you don't need to go get terabytes upon terabytes upon terabytes of data because the file sizes are relatively uh, small. So. Um, tell me uh, one more time, how you use user feedback to develop these? What feedback were you getting and what is, what is that mission in Blackmagic? Well, we really pay attention to what we see on the forums at blackmagicdesign.com, which I encourage everybody to uh, go out and type up your thoughts. Things you like, things you don't like, things uh, don't like, pardon me, things you want to see. Uh, we listen to that stuff. You know, here at NAB, everyone's on their phone writing the notes as we're getting the feature requests. They go to the product managers at the end of the show and they start working on, you know, whatever they want to make next and how they can improve, whether it's a software update or a firmware update. The funniest thing is between the original Ursa Mini uh, 4.6K and the Ursa Mini Pro, pretty much every single individual feature request that we got in chunks whenever we went somewhere 
were directly addressed. The, um, the controls on the side, interchangeable lens mounts, internal ND filters, Bluetooth connectivity. And with the Ursa Mini G2, essentially, we just realized there was a new sensor with new technology, and so many people liked being able to record USB-C out of the pocket cinema camera 4K that we were like, well, let's throw it into the Ursa Mini G2 as well. So now the Ursa Mini G2 can even record out of the USB-C. But every single product that Blackmagic Design makes um, is directly based mostly upon user feedback. And we cherish that feedback, and we really pay attention to it. That's amazing. Well, Jason, is there anything we haven't touched on on the Ursa Mini G2 or the Pocket Cinema Camera 4K that you'd like to touch on? Uh, if there's anything I'd like folks to know is generally that what we're interested in and what we're all about is making technology accessible to everybody. You know, you shouldn't need to be a huge top tier uh, network in order to be able to afford um, digital cinema tools and broadcast tools that can allow you to build a business, build a company, get better jobs, and level yourself up in your own career for yourself or for your company. Um, the whole reason the company started was because, you know, we wanted to make affordable tools that um, everyone can use. And from the software side in DaVinci Resolve, which we turned a, you know, like a half million dollar color grading app into a free application for everyone to download, to our cameras that from the beginning have been, been recording raw video and now have all of these features in um, cameras for only $1,295 right. for the Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. We just really want everyone to be able to create. We care about the user's ability uh, to make whatever content they want to. What is the price point on the Ursa Mini G2? It's uh, $69.95. 69 dollars Yeah, $69.95. Great. Oh, well, I, I completely agree, and that's what I love about Blackmagic since, since the beginning, like I said, is they took things that seemed complicated and unattainable or super expensive and brought them to the forefront in an easy-to-use way that actually worked. So, Jason, thank you very much for bringing by the camera, and thank you very much for joining me here today. Yeah, thank you very much, Steve. I also want to thank Pat from Light Panels for coming on and showing me the brand-new one-by-one Gemini, and I want to thank you all for watching. You can see all of our episodes of Adorama Live on nofilmschool.com, so please go join the conversation by leaving a comment. I'll see you at the next episode of Adorama Live on No Film School.